everyone. Um, today I'm excited. We're going to be doing, we're going to be listening and learning about uh, the CMMC. I'm sure the it's a, you know, everybody's heard about the government. Anybody who does government work knows the about the cybersecurity regulations and that these certifications were coming, but now they're on the horizon. So um, I think it's a good opportunity for us to listen and learn about what a little more about the CMMC program and where to go to get info and things like that. So I want to introduce AJ and Eric and they will uh, educate us on CMMC. Thanks. All right, thanks, Robert. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Okay, I know it's lunch hours. So everybody stretch. Ah, it's an exciting topic we're talking about today. I'm happy to be here. Hopefully, we can learn. I know security can kind of be a boring topic, but we'll try to make it entertaining for you. And and I know we have a mix of industry and um, government. Um, this is something that's important for all of us to be aware of as we protect our supply chain. So. Hopefully this presentation is useful. We want it to be interactive, so chime in on chat. We got about 20 slides and then we're gonna open it up for questions um, and look forward to um, presenting again to this wonderful audience. So with that said, um, this is the outline for the presentation. I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk about our cyber readiness workforce uh, campaign that we're running at Key Cyber and the importance of that. Then we're gonna dive into the agenda, which is you know the cybersecurity model certification program, its structure, the practices and per level, and then what it means to securing our nation's supply chain. More importantly, we're gonna also discuss where government and industry fit in the process. And then uh, what you're probably interested in is finding out the roadmap and the time frame as it develops. And today, as a special bonus, I was uh, very happy to get Eric Power from Beryllium to also talk about some of the tools they have to help us with the process. Like I said, um, this will be interactive, about 10 to 20 slides total, and look forward to lots of questions. So COVID has definitely been unprecedented, especially when it comes to uh, our nation, jobs have been lost, and it's been a difficult time. So our company has focused a lot um, the last quarter on empowering cybersecurity professionals and students to pivot towards that industry. Um, we specialize in consulting in this space and we've always had a, a gap that we needed to fill as far as talent. And um, when you're dealt with bad hand, it's a good opportunity to, to pivot. And so we're really pushing a campaign to get folks trained up in this industry. And um, on the picture here is a, a recent graduate of our ethical hacking. He's a consultant now with uh, cybersecurity. Um, Austin is doing great things and, um, and helping us protect a lot of organizations. The job market is continuing to grow in this sector. So if you know anybody that's looking to pivot to this career or somebody that's in, you know, high school or even college that wants to pursue a career, the jobs are there. Um, the certified ethical hacking is a more advanced certification, but just this last quarter, there was 80,000 plus job openings and they pay fairly well. More importantly, we need more US born folks to help the defense sector in this space. So if you know anyone, please uh, point them to our way and we'll help mentor and get them into this sector. What we're also excited about is for all the classes that we have online, specifically around uh, circle hacking, we're gonna be donating $50 of every class sold to Tech for Troops. For those that don't know who Tech for Troops are, they're based out of Richmond, Virginia, and it's run by Mark Casper, and they're a great nonprofit organization that helps veterans get on their feet. Uh, companies and organizations donate refurbished um, computers. They, they clean them up and they give it to veterans. And some of them don't even have computers to even apply for a job. So Mark trains them up, gives them their own laptop. And, and in this case, if some veterans don't even have, their kids don't have laptops to do virtual uh, learning. So we've actually, don't, they, Mark's organizations donated laptops to veterans' kids as well to help them uh, 
you know, learn from school. Great organization. They're based out of Richmond. They are, I encourage you to get involved with them. They're also doing a Hack for Troops coming up, um, taking sponsors, um, a great nonprofit that helps uh, our veterans. And we're very excited to have partnered up um, for, with them moving forward. These are some of the training classes that are, are offered. They're a little bit more advanced and geared towards uh, somebody that has an understanding of cybersecurity. But without, when you get these certifications, most likely you know, it's gonna lead to a job. Uh, again, it's not for the beginner cybersecurity person. It's more for somebody that has a few years experience and, and wants to uh, further their career or get into the field specifically under um, ethical hacking. And one of the things that's nice about EC Council is um, they've gamified their classroom environment to make it more of a practical learning experience. And that's why a lot of the folks that we hire from these accreditations are ready to go and work and, right, because of the training that's provided by EC Council. Okay, so what is cybersecurity model certification? Well, it was started because, have you been paying attention to the news? We're constantly getting, you know, impacted by vulnerabilities or hacks. And the theft of intellectual property has been happening for years. Um, cyber actors have targeted defense industrial base and they're targeting the 300,000 plus companies that are in this space. So the Office of Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment developed the CMMC framework in concert with DOD stakeholders to help manage this risk. Um, this was also done in conjunction with Johns Hopkins University and Carnegie Mellon University to help come up with the framework for industry. On the left-hand side is the 17 domains with the latest version of the CMMC, which is 1.0.2. These 17 domains, the majority of these domains originate from the FIPS uh, platform, which is a Federal Information Processing Standards, FIPS. And they take that into account and each domain consists of a set of processes and capabilities in turn that go across five different levels. So on the right, you'll see the different levels. And if I go to the next slide here, this is what the framework looks like now. It's evolving, but as, as industry and government have more input, it's gonna be more mature. But if you look on the left, it's level one. The level one takes into account 17 practices across all of those domains that we mentioned in the previous slide. And as you go up in maturity, you have to implement 171 practices to get to level five. The CMC model does not only not look at the maturity of the organization, but it's the implementation of the practices. So by the time you get to level five, you have to have implemented 171 across all five levels and capabilities across 17 domains. So level five is, is of course the most advanced level of certification. This process is evolving. It's uh, taking uh, time to get to where it is now. And of course COVID did slow down some of the timeline, but uh, it, it is coming and it's important. To manage this process, uh, and also look at the security of the supply chain, the CMMC stood up an accreditation body. Uh, the, the website right there talks to the, the accreditation body that's gonna be in charge of uh, accrediting both industry and government uh, on the levels of CMMC. This is something that is still a work in progress, but this next slide talks about the different roles that will be involved in the certification. This next year, there's gonna be assessors and organizations certified to help go in to companies and certify them at certain levels. There will also be consulting firms that will help prepare companies for certification as we go into the roadmap. This next slide is the actual roadmap as it stands right now. Um, it started in January, it's actually started a few years ago, but January is where they, they started the actual CMC roadmap. And as we go into the winter and into uh, 2021, their, the ecosystem will be ready to go live. So companies will be able to start, you know, um, their certification process. 
So what does that mean? So to prepare for that, there's 10 steps that, that you have to do as an organization. Understand that CMMC requirements are, which some of this is explained here, you can go in and do further research. Identify the scope and enterprise organization unit that you need to have certified. Identify what the level of maturity is for your organization that you want to achieve, level one, two, three, or four, five. From there, you have to look at your operations, pre-assess, find a provider that can help you. That could be someone like us or Beryllium to get you to prepare for the accreditation. And then once you've identified the gaps in your process and your uh, different domains, then you're ready to go to the C C3PAO, which is a, the marketplace for accreditors, once they're certified, to come in and perform an actual assessment. That team will come in, they'll be certified by the, the accreditation body, and they'll come in and assess your organization. Once they do that, you'll get this, uh, the findings, and you'll have up to 90 days to resolve any of the findings. Once those have been reviewed, and your findings have, and the gaps have in, your, in your accreditation have been resolved, your certification is good for three years. So if you are an early adopter of this process, this is, could be a good way for you to show um, the government that you're taking security uh, as an important part of your organization. And it also, in some contracts, it could allow you to box out your competition. Let's say you have CMMA level three and somebody does not, and the requirement is that you have level three you could actually have the contract go in your favor because you've taken the time to invest. Um, like I said, this will be rolled out in 2021, and by 2025, this will be a mandatory requirement. So with that said, there's a lot of work involved in doing this, and I wanted to bring in a company that understands this process and has come up with the tool to help organizations get to the maturity level. I'm very excited to have my friend Eric present um, their solutions and talk about adopting the CMMC into your organization. With that said, Eric, passing it on to you. Awesome, thank you, AJ, and thanks for everybody for uh, attending today. Uh, if I do have any background noise, please bear with me. I am traveling and I found the quietest, not hard to do today, uh, spot in the airport um, to be able to, to join you all today. So as, as AJ had mentioned on the front side of this, uh, that was the one important thing for, um, I'm gonna share my screen here now. And then AJ, please confirm that uh, my screen is uh, being shared. Yeah, I can see it, perfect. Per perfect, all right. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind with all the, of the noise that's currently in existence, if you were to do a Google search of CMMC and the, and the tenure requirements, um, there's a lot of organizations that are, that are popping up and we're hearing it from our clients and we're also hearing it from uh, lectures and education sessions. Um, AJ shared earlier the, the CMMCAB.org. Make sure you go there to cross-reference uh, any information that you do uh, find. And the reason why I share that is uh, there's a couple of, of uh, myths that are in existence today, so I'll kind of clear those up right away before we hop into this. Um, so a couple of, uh, we believe they're, they're very uh, large wins. So for the folks that are on the, on the uh, joining us today, uh, if you go back to the world of NIST 800-171 and DFARS, it was this um, self-attestation, best practice, let's follow 110 controls to better our supply chain within the DOD. Um, during that period of time, over the last cor over the course of the last few years, as CMMC came into existence, um, they've been working to try to make this uh, practical. And the reason why the NIST 100171 is very subjective is they don't want you to have to reinvent your entire organization to uh, buy a bunch of new equipment. Uh, we always refer to it as the blinky boxes uh, and invest uh, a large amount of money, not only building, but also maintaining that program. So with the CMMC now becoming certification, um, we've got a couple of things and a couple of victories we believe for industry while still achieving that goal of safety. If you fall into that level three category, it's a, every three years you will need to be certified. So think of it as a directory and as you're bidding on a contract or performing work for a DOD and uh, eventually uh, federal and state agencies, um, there's going to be a directory. And if you fall into that level three, all that means to you today is this. 
if NIST 800 171, those 110 controls plus those additional 20 or so controls, our estimation of the 300,000 or so uh, subcontractors that are uh, su supporting the defense industrial base, only 400 to 1,000 of those organizations are going to fall into that level four or five. So really, and if you're thinking of where do I start, what do I do, I've seen some of this language in my contract. First thing I'm going to tell you to do is go look at any contract you're currently performing and look up DFARS. Uh, look for a DFARS clause within your contract. Uh, and then also look for NIST 800 language because most of the phone calls we field today are, hey, can you help us get CMMC level three? And I always tell them, well, first of all, no one can certify you right now. Uh, so if someone's telling you that they are, please let us know. But let's start with 800-171. But here's the other good news for the, uh, to uh, what we believe for small businesses especially. When it comes time for certification, it's for new and renewing contracts only with that level identified within the contract and it is not needed until award or performance of that contract. So we're not having to tell you, and we're not telling you you have to go invest in certification prior to award. What you wanna do is get that NIST 800 get those controls in place, and then upon award, we weigh the benefit analysis for our business. And I wanted to share that because I think it's, uh, rather than an every year certification, which can be costly, we also have, uh, and I'll dive into this today, the ability in today's world to be on a journey to cyber uh, maturity, right? Uh, so I'll hop into that in a second. So at just kind of a recap, AJ uh, shared this earlier. Uh, here are the control families that we're looking at, and I'm not gonna go through a breakdown of each one, but I wanted to show this again for, is that there's a lot of stuff going on, and it's that blend of technical and administrative controls, and it's not just a, hey, we achieved it, it's truly a program um, that needs to be maintained after the fact. Um, so if you think about it in terms of just technical, uh, so we're thinking in terms of access control. So who's accessing our systems? Who can prove it? This is all about that insider threat and then all about um, being able to point at any given time, this person had access to the system, they were, per they were allowed or they did not have access to the system. Can we defend our organization that we did everything in our power to control access? Um, I'm gonna fly through some of these. These are all living in that technical control standpoint. And what we as an organization, Brilliant, and I'll push pause here for a moment. <laughs> Um, as a uh, subject matter expert surrounding uh, control frameworks, NIST 153, 800, 171, and every one other, uh, the sun that's developed off of that, we were providing assessments the same way a lot of organizations today are, right? We'll perform an assessment, we'll give you uh, that gap analysis report, we'll provide some uh, low-hanging fruit remediation uh, type of uh, uh, efforts to help support your existing team, and then we'll give you policy procedures, and then that organization is now on to the next client. But the thing, uh, in, in our opinion, and through our methodology, is that most organizations are lucky to have a full-time dedicated IT person. And if they have a managed service provider, they're really focused on IT, which in our world comes down to ops. We're very oper uh, operation-centric. We wanna make sure things are working and we, we have best practice perhaps. We usually think of security as, a, uh, for instance, like a uh, antivirus or some sort of uh, blinky box as we refer to it. So what we realized pretty quickly is that for all the organizations, the 300,000 or so organizations are gonna fall into this of handling controlled unclassified information. And now just basically think about it in terms of data. You're performing a contract or performing work for another entity, that data doesn't belong to you. And they basically wanna save, they safeguard that. We're gonna do that through these, 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 uh, these needs. So what we realized pretty quickly is the challenges most organizations face is that we could give them all the tools in the world, we could give them the, the best uh, report in the world with the executive summaries, and we can tell them, and on average, it was about a 25 to 35% of uh, controls being met for those assessments that we were performing. Why would we want someone to spend their security budget just to find out how wrong they are or how bad they're doing? They can do that through proper scoping, or we can provide someone with a free tool to go through that initial assessment. So we can, we can focus our security budget on solving this and creating solutions. So what I'm showing here on the right side of the screen as we move into this uh, next, you know, we basically can take all those technical controls and our mission is let's eliminate organizations from having to have a full-time security person. As AJ mentioned, there's a huge talent shortage right now today. I'm not gonna give metrics because they, they fluctuate, but it's in the millions. And it's a musical chairs game. And we're both very heavily involved in uh, helping veterans transition into this space because it's a natural fit, but it's also a great opportunity for a career change for people as we try to bolster our, our um, scientific and, and security professionals in our country. But let's just talk about what it is today. 
those organizations have that IT and that ops centric type person, we wanted to create a system that eliminated the uh, a couple of things. Let's not buy the wrong stuff and hope it works. Let's not buy a bunch of stuff and then assess and then figure out what we're missing. Let's solve for that and create an environment so people will be able to work on this information, work on it safely, and be able to still meet our compliance needs. So I'm going to pause there. And another thought I just want to introduce is uh, we really we hear this a lot. Right? It's it's compliance, and we are you compliant, and, and what does that mean? But we're also very well aware that compliance and being compliant isn't necessarily being secure. And comp uh, compliance in our world isn't security. So in our world, it's the it's the let's pass that that methodology on to our clients. And I think if you're thinking of, of the product that we created, we, it's called QuickTrack. Of course, CUI is controlled unclassified information. Um, but track is training, risk assessment, administration, and controls. The technology portion of this is only 70, or excuse me, it's a large portion. It's 70% of what you need to do in order to be compliant. We can eliminate that with a remote session uh, environment for people to be able to operate, work on, store, transmit, control, and classified information. We can now focus most of our efforts on you, the business, because we still need to round out that other 30%. So here's that technical challenge that most folks are running into. How do we have proper encryption on our systems? How are we logging? How are we, how are we uh, having alerts for events uh, tuned correctly? Um, do we have multi-factor authentication into our network? And then are we managing this? Who's managing it? And so what we noticed is these were the three major um, challenges that organizations are facing. We knew they were gonna have to buy this type of stuff anyway. So our first year in business, we went out to these technology partners and we said, listen, here's a large uh, population of organizations that need your help. They're not gonna be able to buy it off the shelf for the cost that you're selling it for because they don't even, in most cases, know how to put it together in a, in a fashion to meet their compliance, let alone use it efficiently. So grow as we grow. Um, our, our second and uh, third year of developing and creating this, uh, and, and now we're into uh, our, our fourth year, is how can we make this on the program side uh, better for our access for our people? So again, I just will just think in terms of, I want everyone on the phone today, just think of your business and think of your different departments. And we'll just talk in, in generalities. We've got our manager, our C-suite, we've got our technical, um, our um, uh, finance, and then we have our engineering, or if we're not making something, our day-to-day -day workforce. Certain people within the organization, uh, of your organization are going to have a need to access what would be considered controlled and classified information and certain people don't so let's start there and instead of trying to and again we're all about best practice security but instead of trying to harness the entire business and that and, and putting the entire business in scope of what will eventually be a certification and in some cases today are already being audited let's scope and get the right people in and off or excuse me in a different system and leave the regular data to your network so the day that an auditor walks in or a certifier walks in we're telling them right away if and when we receive this information this on a separate network how are you doing that and that's how we uh, and we can display that through our policy procedure set um, so what we've essentially done with those technology partners we wrap that all in our assessments then turn to that physical portion, the admin side. We're looking at, uh, for instance, uh, logins at the front desk. Um, do we have cameras on uh, physical uh, control and classified information? Do we have the we shall statements to protect the business in court on, of our policy documentation? And then we train. We train. Uh, and, and the frontline defense for our businesses are our people, whether they're an intentional or unintentional insider threat. Um, it, it is a requirement to go through training, but we can also make it where it's not so government ease and, and dry. So we wrap all those components into this program that is called QuickTrack. And in the center of it is that blend of that technical, uh, fully hosted, uh, preloaded with Office 365, email sharing, encryption, the same, everything that you would need to, be ta to meet your obligations on the technical side is covered in the system. And then the rest is what we round out with our on-site and, and our guidance. So, I'm just going to show quickly here uh, what this looks like from a login standpoint. So I just want you to think of your workforce. Okay, so let's think about the person that's negotiating contracts. We have we have uh, information that has um, billing, what the project's for, the details of that. Let's say we're performing something, we're making something, or let's say we're staffing something. Uh, we have uh, that type of information. Well, this is how we're going to access that system because this is where we're going to store that information. Um, this is all the uh, all the items that are included inside the QuickTrack system. 
and the program. And I just want to show you this is how easy it is to log into. This is just a live uh, live uh, demo. We haven't uh, put it up on our website yet because we're um, I think it's, it's due to come on. But this is uh, somebody logging in to the QuickTrack system. So uh, the first step for our clients is we uh, provision the account and the, the, the employee that's been deemed a person that needs to handle this type of information gets this icon, which loads this. They're now establishing their multi-factor authentication into the network. Um, we're going to authenticate here. And then once we hit approve, we're establishing that, that VPN tunnel into uh, where, where this is hosted. It is hosted in what's called the 511 building here in Minneapolis. One of the most secure locations in the Midwest. We'll get into the details on another day. Um, and this is what it looks like. This is exactly what it was meant to look like. It's supposed to be uh, it's easy for our, uh, our our average employees, and we say average just because, uh, in terms of security knowledge, we want folks to be able to work in an environment that looks the same. But behind the scenes is all that that monitoring, alerting, uh, encryption, sharing. Um, and it's literally a seven to 12 second login process. They can go about their day-to-day -day business. And so I just want everyone to think about when the time comes for an audit or a certification, I'll just give you the averages. 80% um, of all businesses in the defense industrial base are 50 employees or less. And of that 50, uh, of those numbers, 50% are 20 employees or less. So what we do right out the gate is we scope shrink immediately. If you don't need access to this information, let's not include them because that puts us at risk for lots of different reasons. But in this particular case, it puts us at risk from an auditory standpoint. Um, so let's just say a 20 person company has three people that are handling CUI. We pull them off the network. We can now confidently tell any client, prime, state, local, or even uh, regular, um, if we're doing regular commercial work, uh, this, this supersedes HIPAA uh, requirements. This supersedes a lot of different requirements, and we can stack and add if we have to meet uh, other obligations to protect the information. But really, the, the mission focus is: we pull people off the network. We can defend that stance, and we, we can we can do it affordably because it's much more affordable uh, affordable to do it this way than try to focus on the entire business at once. So I'll finish the log out process, and. That is it for uh, that portion. Um, the last piece I'll, I just want to make sure I mention is that the after fact, right? So what we typically stay on for, um, so let's say we have a, a, an organization that's been provisioned into QuickTrack, where we're working in that system, we've provided those policy procedure, POEM, SSPs, gone through our training. Now what we do behind the scenes, we stay as your subject matter expert. So, hey, we're filling out a contract that has a question about how we're doing this. Great, we'll set up a, we'll set up a meeting. Or can you fly in and be uh, doing this for a DCMA type audit? Great, we can help support that. So the, the after fact and running the program, it's estimated at 2,000 person per uh, hour job a year to manage a CFARS or CMMC program. We can eliminate that by simply having a program champion inside the business, and then they can utilize um, access to our folks uh, at any given time uh, after the fact. So I'll leave it at that for today uh, without going into any of the further detail and, and open it up for questions. And uh, uh, thanks again for everybody joining here today. And I wasn't wrapping it up for everybody. I don't know if anyone else is on mute. I just want to make sure I wasn't saying, have a good day. No. So, um, so we have one question so far. So if anybody wants to ask a question, please um, add it to the Q&A. Uh, from Bill Sorrentino from LeapCore Services. He said, we're a federal construction contractor doing unclassified work. What level of certification will my company need to be able to continue to do federal construction work? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I guess I just want to clarify one thing and maybe we can get a response while I'm, I'm kind of talking you through this. Um, so we're, we're doing federal work and it's unclassified. I just want to make sure that we're not speaking in terms of, is it, is it currently, is it controlled unclassified or is it considered unclassified? Control unclassified is still that classification. So I just want to make sure if we can get a quick response out of that because that'll dictate kind of that answer. Uh, unclassified. Okay. So as it stands today from the Fed side, um, and, and AJ, you can talk a little bit more about this and, and how the, uh, the world's going to be shaping up. We do know that uh, federal and state are going to be adopting this. We do have, uh, in existence today, FAR clauses within our contract. Um, 
the enforceability is a little bit different than, than what we're looking at from the DOD support and the second, third, fourth tier. Um, AJ, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, the Fed side, and then I can round out the, the last portion of that? Yeah, uh, at, at its minimum, you have to be level level one for unclassified. So uh, that that's a that's definitely going to be a requirement. Uh, but it's also going to be the program office and the organization. If uh, so, you have to look at the collective of the data. If you take a bunch of unclass data and put it together, where it becomes valuable, they could also say that's going to go up. But for sure, it's definitely at least level one. For um, some of this is subjective. I think it uh, depends on the uh, the government and the, the industry partner as well. But for, at its basic, you have to be level one for sure. Okay, and just to kind of uh, to, and, and thank you, AJ. So, I think in terms of level one, is basic. Um, basic best practice. So we're thinking of uh, encryption, multi-factor authentication, uh, and then having some paperwork wrapped around it. So uh, we can, uh, and we, AJ, you and I can put something together for all the attendees today to kind of walk through what it looks like from a, you know, what does that mean at the level one rate? We, we do have a presentation that we've recently done. I can send that out and AJ, we can talk after. But um, so I think in terms of level one as being that basic, if it's ever considered, uh, and again, we've seen this in the medical space, right? So we may have blanket statements because that's what lawyers do. And if it's performance of a certain contract, we may have somebody that, that says you will need to adhere to this level. Um, either regardless of the path we go down, that, that initial level one is going to be, um, you can map that all back to this state 10171. And if anybody wants any further clarification, for the time being, though, back to that, really answer that question. Right now, you're not going to see that CMMC language in your contract. I would look at uh, what stipulations are currently um, uh, laid within your contract of your obligation of protecting uh, certain types of information. Because right now, if anybody wants to look into their current contracts and you look for that DFARS or FAR clause within your contract, take a look at that. What that's essentially saying right now for us in the DOD side, uh, especially in the supply chain side, is their, their blanket statement and 80% of contracts that are out there have that clause in there, which uh, again, I think it was done due to uh, lack of uh, force into the primes actually dictating what this type of project would be. But to AJ's point, all this un unclassified information, controlled unclassified information, that is the reason why this became in existence anyway. Reverse engineering at the subcontractor level to piece together whether it's uh, personnel information, financial information, who the contract's being performed information, um, mechanical parts or creations or engineering CAD, all that stuff. If it gets combined with other control and classified, it moves up that classification chart. And our enemy is pretty smart to figure out that I can go after, for instance, 500 machine shops to figure out how to put together an uh, F-35 reverse engineered because they're probably a little bit less likely to have the same defenses as a Lockheed Martin for that matter. So that's the, the mindset of to why you have to be at a bare minimum, that level one, which at least puts some sort of barrier and a little bit more of a difficult target. Great question. And uh, again, follow up with us and we'll be glad to answer anything more specifically. All right, um, next question. Is the requirement in 2021 to be certified at the appropriate level necessary to bid on federal government work in the CUI category? If true, how are all the companies involved in this area going to get certified by early next year? Seems like the certification will um, need will exceed the capacity. Another great question. Uh, the easiest way to explain it is right now certification. Yeah, if you think of, I think the last target, uh, AJ, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they uh, something around, along the lines of 5,000 by the end of next year. Um, uh, I'd be less concerned right now, and this is just very par for the course for some of the um, um, questions that we receive daily, is we say focus less on being certified and focus more on your obligation right now law let's just play within the law we, uh, we we can still play within the world of if you have that in your in your clause and you have to do something and you haven't seen certification level yet because you, you're, you're not going to see that yet um focus on that 800 171 and focus on that because you don't have to be perfect as it stands today you do not have to be perfect um what the reason why the plan of action and milestone and system security plan is in existence within the 800 171 is as long as you display that you assess where you're at, you examine where you're going, and you have a plan on how to get there, and you can display that, 
and then we make those uh, changes along the way. In most cases, and it depends on the contract, but because we've seen a couple variations in uh, depending on who the prime or the DoD uh, directed. Um, but in most cases, we can still play in that world. And I'll get, I'm going to bounce right to the next question and tie that in as far as do we need to be 100% compliant with 171. By the time certification um, needs, uh, uh, or by the time certification becomes live and well, the expectation is all um, action items on the plan of action milestones for NIST 100-171 are completed. So it's that, that's where this turns into this pass fail. So we're going to work out of the world of your DPARS clause and being able to use your POAM to your advantage and be able to display what you're doing within your system security plan. By the time we get the certification, it will be fully expected that all 100, uh, or all 100, uh, this 100, 171, 110 controls are being met with those additional CMC requirements. And then that last question was a little bit specific to that level one. So think about the level one and having, uh, it's, a, it's a portion of, NIST 171 controls that need to be met to achieve that level one. Because at this point, once we break from that, the CMMT level three is basically dictating that all 171 additional controls are in place, and the level one will, will be that uh, the smaller number. At, at AJ, and I don't have it in front of me right now, I'm on a uh, on very little sleep here. I think it's 17 total controls that need to be met within that level one. Once you're done with that, uh, yes, you can be certified to that level. Yeah, you're right. It's 17 controls. Uh, great, great answer, uh, Eric. Uh, so uh, the next question is, are the contracted security requirements as a result of having access to government systems by their personnel or their operations that support the government mission? I think it's both. If you look at um, this, the, what's happened over the last they're not only targeting insider folks, they're targeting their systems. I mean, just look at both industry and also government um, the target hack a few years ago they came in through the HVAC system so anybody on the supply chain and as the larger companies have the budgets to secure their um, systems it's going to go down to the weakest link in the supply chain so they'll actually go after the smaller businesses that do work for the larger businesses so answer that question it's both okay uh, did anybody else have any questions? Sorry, Eric, I muted you. You had some background noise going on. I'll, I'll uh, unmute you in case you have something else to say. Yeah, hey, uh, uh, Leanne, this is Rob. I just, Rob Flowers, I just wanted to remind everybody, I forgot to mention it in the introduction. I put it in the chat, but I know some people might be out there on the phones, but um, if you need a PDH cert, please either get me in the chat if you're online or um, if you're hooked up to the computer and your webinar where you can do the chat. If not, send me an email. Um, let me know you need a PDH cert for this session. So just let me know. Thanks. Perfect. And uh, I'll just go back quickly on the, uh, the last question. So some of our larger clients, they have folks in the field that have access to government systems. It's, it's their responsibility to protect those systems while your people are, are on their systems. But then on your side of the house. We have to make sure that uh, if they're saving information, storing information, bringing stuff back, we'll call it to home base, and we're doing those kind of communications, you know, contract negotiations, um, where are we storing that type of data? You'll have an obligation to protect your stuff, but there's an easy way to do that from uh, parceling, if you will, uh, being able to del delineate that within your policy documentation that when, when we have people in the field, they will operate this way from a best practice standpoint. And then if it's, a, if it's a, a right situation, and we do see this often, if that, that, uh, those personnel are accessing government systems and we can uh, put some compensating controls around that, we can make our effort level as an organization much, uh, much easier, um, to, to our, our goals much easier to achieve. But there's just, there's just some um, in-house stuff we would wanna do. But as far as your actual technical systems, um, it would take, simply a, a 20 minute scoping conversation to figure out how that data is flowing. And so I guess for everybody that's on the phone today, just really think about this. Instead of thinking in terms of systems and, and, and thinking in terms of federal and gov uh, DOD systems, this whole mission is about where is that data? Is it separate from my regular data? Can you show me who has access to it? And can you prove to me that you have parameters to make sure that we know who's coming in and out? And that really is the gist of this entire thing. That's that really is. I just want to make sure I highlight that before we wrap up today. 
Sure. So they, we had one other question. Um, how will we know what CMMC level will be required per industry? I know that it'll be on the contract, but for preparing, where should we aim? Another good question. Um, so with in, in regards to kind of getting this prep work done, I think a great place, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit it again, is go back into your existing contract. Even if you wanna redact it, feel free to send it to most of our engagements. Um, even if it just turns into just a conversation, there's no expectation uh, uh, expected, I guess is a, proper, a non proper sentence. Um, we have folks send us uh, redacted contracts with certain uh, tidbits to help kind of provide that kind of clarity. If you have that DFARS language in your contract today, or you have that uh, mentioning of the 800-171, it's a great place to start. That means that you're falling into that category. It's a very tough question to answer, simply because if you think about it in terms of even the, the CMMC working groups and how they've, they've explained this since June of last year, if you're doing work for the government, you're going to be expected to have basic cyber uh, cyber hygiene period um, we we kind of break them up internally to our organization as uh, three different cat or excuse me multiple different categories we've got our um, creators right so production heavy environments uh, engineering architectural manufacturing that's a completely different animal uh, and it's a different approach to how we solve that we've got our staffing um, uh, medical support and um, and, and admin kind of in another category. And then we've got our, our servicing. So there's contracting through construction, renovation, um, and support. We break those, it really does break down into three categories. So if you can be a little clearer and if you wanna do a follow-up as to what kind of work you're performing, I could probably give you a better idea um, because it's, it should be pretty easy to make a guesstimate. But if you see DFARS in your, in your contract, just assume con, uh, CMMC level three. I don't think anyone on this phone should be concerned unless you're doing some some stuff that's pushing outside of the bounds of controlled and classified. I don't think anybody here should be concerned with level four or five. As a matter of fact, if I'm anybody on the phone today, I'm more I'm thinking about getting my NIST standard 171 stuff done right now and being less concerned about CMMC because that stuff will naturally fit, and um, uh, you'll be you'll be a day or two away from being perfect rather than starting over when this thing drops. Yeah, uh, I agree with everything Eric said. Just one other thing I want to say is on our website, we did a, a blog a few years ago, or a few weeks ago, that, that talks about the 10 steps. Um, and I would definitely uh, recommend to get into level one as a, as a base requirement. And then, you know, like, like Eric was saying, it's going to depend on your contractual status. But um, outside of CMMC, I think Eric and I can tell you, uh, you should do this anyway, right? You, you should definitely try to take uh, cyber awareness and the importance of it, um, whether you're doing work with the DOD or not. It's, it's just, it, there are folks out there that are trying to get to your intellectual property and or, you know, do fraudulent activity. So outside of these processes, you should definitely try to have and maintain good hygiene. Yeah, and if anyone is here, and we're a, we're a non-reseller, non we're in a fully agnostic security company, so yes, we, we created QuickTrack and that's a great tool and it's a great uh, quick fix. I mean, we can get people compliant and done in 14 to 30 days and, and that's, that's the right fit for some folks. But for, for the rest of it, right? We, if, you're, if you've got uh, good practices in place or you're already doing a lot of really interesting uh, ways of protecting your intellectual property and you've got systems in place and maybe you're using a managed service provider and they just need to turn a couple of features on or you maybe you know need to change a couple of things uh, within your systems. We, um, we have a lot of good vetted friends in this business, uh, whether it's, it is encryption, whether it's emailing, whether it's um, logging, alerting, uh, help in the field, you know, between AJ and his, his team and ours. Um, there's plenty of folks out there to help. And uh, we, again, we're, we will never resell a technology. So if anybody's looking for a kind of a, even a, a question in regard to that, we have no problem pointing in the right direction because um, most of these folks, they, they're, uh, uh, they went into business to solve problems, and that's exactly what we're hoping that this thing becomes. Let's solve the problem of losing our intellectual property, and and let's make this less about paperwork and hoping we pass it out, and let's just let's just do it right the first time. Good. Thank you guys so much for um, all of the good information. Looks like we have one more question here. Uh, please repeat repeat the source and the correct number for the. 800 
171 requirement? Yes. Yep. So if you if you were uh, uh, look at NIST 800 171, I'm just trying to bring up another presentation here um, while I have it because I think I could even send out a link quickly. There's a lot of information on it. Um, but if you look into, if you want to look even, you can do a keyword search within existing contracts. Um, DFARS 252.204, tax 7012. Again, that's 252.204, tax 7012. Um, you can, um, that, that's a great place to start to think about, okay, what are you already being expected to do? And then if you're on the federal side, uh, federal side, look up uh, FAR clause and then look up NIST 800-171. Um, that'll be a good place to think about, uh, or a good place to start if this is gonna be applicable to you. So if I hope that helps answer the question. And again, um, feel free, to, I'm gonna put, uh, AJ, I know you already put yours up, I'll put mine up too. Any questions? Well, we, we live, eat, and breathe, and sleep this stuff. We're happy to help. Um, we don't charge people for answering, answering good questions. So feel free to reach out to any of us, and we'll be glad to help. Thank you again for an um, informative presentation. This is so important to so many people right now. Um, and, and like you said, it's great practice, even without the requirements. Um, to keep your company you know, safe and your interactions with the government safe. Uh, we will be um, submitting a PDH certificate. So again, please reach out to us if you need one, um, you know, make a note in the chat, or if you can't reach the chat right now, uh, send an email um, and we will make sure you get your PDH certificate. Um, and, uh, We will again be um, submitting this recording uh, to our website, so you'll be able to access uh, the slide decks and the uh, the actual recording of the webinar that way. So, if you have a hard time finding it in the next couple of days, please just uh, reach out to us, and we will um, we'll have you know that available for you. So thank you, I'm gonna stop the recording now and uh, if anybody else has any other questions or wants to continue the discussion, uh, we'll stay on for a couple more minutes, thank you.